Hello! Welcome to the Rotten Horror Picture Show, the horror movie podcast where we talk about films off the Rotten Tomatoes 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list. My name is Clay. Usually with me is Amanda, but Amanda is on vacation like a jerk. So with me today is Dan. Full name or just Dan? Dan McQueen. Dan McQueen. Yeah. No relation to Steve McQueen. Or Lightning McQueen. Have they have we confirmed that? <laughs> Uh, Dan is, um, he is the, uh, uh, he runs the website shadowsofnoir.com, which um, talks about all things film noir. He's also my cousin, so there's a little bit of nepotism going on here. Just um, a little. How are you doing, Dan? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Uh, what goes on at your website? Tell us a little bit about it. Um, so the website is designed just to be kind of like a central spot where we have some written articles. We also have links to the podcast that I do, Shadows of Noir podcast, and um, built into it some kind of group discussion areas where you can try and go in there, talk about different things. It's really kind of meant for that to kind of bring people together mm-hmm. so that they can discuss film noir, discuss the movies they love, talk about new topics, things like that. Nice. So why Why film noir? So, film noir has always been my personal favorite area. Um, I got really into film in college. Mm -hmm. Um, Started out going through, like probably a lot of people, going through a lot of the top 100 lists out there. American Film Institute, a bunch of others. Top top 100 100 lists. Why would you ever do anything like that? (laughs) Did you go through the, is there, is there a Rotten Tomatoes one? I'm sure it's terrible. I actually do not know. I don't think I've ever looked at the Rotten to, uh, Tomatoes one, um, but I do think that this was probably predating Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so just to get a little bit of a bearing in terms of film history, I went through that, a lot of reading and stuff like that. I always gravitated towards black and white films that put a heavy emphasis on innovative cinematography mm-hmm. and, um, yeah, I uh, wanted to start a little side project a couple of years ago, so decided to do that website, do the accompanying podcast for it, and um, yeah, been uh, been uh, doing doing that for a few months now. So. Yeah, excellent, and it's 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 really good stuff too. Podcasts are really yep. really good, really well informed stuff. Oh, well, thank you. There's one episode on Kiss Me Deadly that's really good. Yeah, yeah, there was a really good guest host on that one. Thank um, you. I mean, that's. That person should thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, probably should. I'll, I'll make sure I let him know. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, you are here today because we're talking about Night of the Hunter, which is a bit of a crossover episode for us because it is, um, would you consider Night of the Hunter a film noir movie? Well, so. short, short answer now, we can get into it more. Short later. answer now, maybe. Maybe? Okay. Mostly. Yeah. That's a better better word than maybe. Mostly. But it is number thirty six on our horror Rotten Tomatoes horror list with a ninety three percent Rotten Tomato score, ninety percent audience score, which is pretty interesting if you know the history of the movie given how it was kind of a big flop at the time, but I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll get into a little bit of that. Um had you seen this before? I had actually only seen it once before mm-hmm. and you and I had spoken about potentially doing this at some point, so I had held back on watching it, but right. um, did get a chance to watch it a few times in preparation for this. Um, had you seen it before? Yes. I saw this, I think I've seen it twice before this. The first time I saw it was, I think, during one of the marathons that I used to do mm-hmm. um, with my buddy Jim. Um, you know what? No, I think I, I think my mother recommended this movie to me. I think that was the really? first time, and then I think I might have come back to it for one of those marathons when we were looking for stuff. Like I, I think so. I might have watched it when I was in like high school okay. on her recommendation. Yeah, and then I came back to it years later because it was one in the back of my head that was mm-hmm. like, you know, I think that one was pretty good. Maybe I should check that out again. So I wonder if your mom <clears throat> gravitated towards it because of the singing. Maybe she does. She is known for singing creepy stuff around. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, but yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, but we're going to take a quick break and play the trailer and come back and talk about it. Bene, 
never told you he'd throw it in the river, did he? I can hear you whispering, children, so I know you're down there. I can feel myself getting awful mad. Here is all the passion and suspense, the heart-pounding warmth of the best-selling novel that gripped millions. Oh, wake up! Come on! Oh. Superb, unforgettable performances by an extraordinary array of talent. Figured I was gone, huh? Run. Hide in the staircase. Run quick! Ruby, get! What do you want? I want them kids. I'm giving you to the count of three to get out of here, then I'm coming across the kitchen shooting. The combined powers of Paul Gregory and Charles Lawton brought the King Mutiny Court Martial to Broadway. Now the screen receives that same creative, electrifying impact. The night of the hunter. Okay, Night of the Hunter from 1955, directed by Charles Lawton, who he was a well-known actor, but this is his only film directing credit, written by James Agee uh, with con contributions from Charles Lawton based on the novel by Davis, Davis Grubb. And it stars Robert Mitchum, Shelley Winters, Lillian Gish, James Gleason, Sally Jane Bruce, Billy Chapin, and the pilot from Airplane. <laughs> Danny, what happens in Night of the Hunter? Night of the Hunter, we have a fake preacher who preys on widows and mm -hmm. tries to steal their nest egg, um, inheritance, whatever, whatever uh, money they have stored away. So he is a murderous person on top of it. Uh, he, he gets that through some very bad means. And he ends up in the same jail cell as a convicted robber and murderer who has stocked away $10,000 for his children. He then, uh, Robert Mitchum's character, Harry Powell, goes after that money and it becomes a chase uh, where the kids know where it is and he is infiltrating their family and then chasing them even beyond that to try and recover that money. Very good. And you did that with nothing in front of you. I Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> um, some things you'll find in this movie include a literal pocket knife. Yes. Which is one of the more um, gratuitous images in the movie. Yes. In um, a movie that's full of imagery, one that's pretty unmistakable. Yes. For the different levels that it, 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 uh, it operates on. I'm not sure how they got a few of those things past the censors. Yeah. This is an interesting movie. Well, we'll get into that stuff. Yeah. Uh, a person annoyingly explaining their tattoos that no one has asked them about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nosy neighbors whose opinion are extreme to say the least a children's doll worth ten thousand dollars a horrible christmas present honestly when he wraps that apple that he got from the other room in her own doily and she's like i it was like every mother's reaction when she's like oh this is the greatest thing i've ever received in my life yeah i was really taken aback um by the way she reacted to it <laughs> <laughs> because it was very short-sighted and um not very thoughtful yes <laughs> But thought doesn't matter when metaphor is involved, I guess. Yes. Uh, and questionable parenting, I would say. This is a solid questionable parenting movie. Yes, I would say so, too. Um, I know that that is a theme on your podcast. Today. It is. <laughs> it is a running theme. Yeah. Um, so where are we in film noir history? Because the, the, the pocket of film noir is only like 15 years, right? It's probably a little closer to 20 it really depends upon where you throw those bookmarks yeah the most commonly referenced span is from 1941 to 1958 mm -hmm. with the maltese falcon starting it and then touch of evil ending it however depending upon who you're reading what book you're reading who's who's speaking sometimes they include as early as 1940, sometimes even 1930s. But I, I think that 1940, 1941 is your real start. And then somewhere between 1958 to 1960 is where that classic era eventually turns into, you know, post-classic sure. and neo-noir territory. What's the film that is considered like the kickoff for, is it like Maltese Falcon? Usually Maltese Falcon. Yeah. A lot of people will reference Stranger on the Third Floor. That came out in the summer of 1940. Mm -hmm. And there were several films between there that made a lot of um, 
a lot of leaps in that direction before the Maltese Falcon came out, but that was really the one that um, most people will will look at, um, most people will reference, and is probably the most overt example that we're into some brand new territory here. Mm. Are there any movies that people reference, or I should say assholes like me reference, who, who are the ones who are like, well, actually... Halloween wasn't the first slasher movie because nobody talks about Black Christmas in 1973. Is there any, anything like that? There are. Um, I mean, I, I need to know so I can say that. <laughs> I, I've even seen um, online somewhere. I've seen M in a list of Ooh, film okay. noir, even though that that I think 99 uh, percent of people would probably just flat out associate that with German expressionism mm-hmm. and not go into the bridge of film noir obviously there was a huge link there but he wears a hat in that movie he does wear a hat um he is you know a very villainous person obviously yep. uh, there's a, there's a lot of things that you will see in film noir um in that movie but um most people will say that that is um well before the start yeah. of it that's what's so fascinating well i don't know if fascinating is the right word but these genres are so interesting to me because there are always the the movies that are referred to as sort of like the touchstone movies, mm-hmm. but like with anything, you can see the build up to it yep. and stuff. You know, it's like in music when people say, "Well, what was the first heavy metal album?" Oh, well, Black Sabbath's first album. Well, 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 don't forget about Led Zeppelin. Well, you know, actually, the Kinks were playing. Pre- it's like that doesn't count. That's the exactly. It's really tough to draw the line in the sand where, and I I feel like that's an issue too where the lists of of noir films that are out there Mm -hmm. they really have a wide variation in terms of there are ones that have six seven hundred films in there and there are some that only have maybe like 200 it really is like um when does it have enough noir characteristic Mm. to be considered a film noir to that particular person that's why i kind of tend to include a film in the canon if anybody talks about it yeah um but it's it's so interesting actually one of the recent books i read was uh by imogen sarah smith and she talks about almost like a proof rating for a noir film similar to an alcoholic drink very appropriate Yeah, exactly so like something like out of the past which is just as noir as it gets in terms of the different um aspects of the film that would be like you know a a hundred proof whiskey mm-hmm. versus night of the hunter, which is an unbelievable film. And we'll talk about it, but it's one of those, you know, obviously this is a horror podcast and it's on your horror list. Is it film noir? Is it horror? Is it neither of those? Right, is yeah. it something else entirely? Um, so the proof on night of the hunter would be a lot lower. Um, but not that that takes away anything about how good the film is. Right. Yeah. And the crossover, I, I find to be very interesting because as we sort of talked about on your show when I when I did Kiss Me Deadly, yeah. um, the the visual language for both of these genres were kind of started by the same people. Yes. Because it all kind of funnels back to the German expressionist stuff. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those guys who left Germany um, in the 20s and 30s came to California, to Hollywood, yep. and were, were doing these black and white movies that became film noir. You know, you've got your... Nosferatu's and stuff that that lead directly into your Dracula's and Frankenstein's, and mm-hmm. as we mentioned on that show, <clears throat> Robert Siodmak, who's a big film noir guy, yep. he also directed Son of Dracula. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys kind of had their toes in all these different genres and stuff, kind of really defining the way that stuff looked. Yeah, and I think that that's actually a fantastic thing to bring up for this discussion mm. is because this movie that so much parallels both of those. So much of it is based in the American version of expressionism. Yeah. And the other thing is the homage that Charles Lawton was trying to play to silent films. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's got Lillian Gish in there. I know. A big fil- I, silent film star. I know. Seriously. And um, I, think, um, I think the commentary that I listened to, they were talking about... Um, Orphans of the Storm and Broken Blossoms by D.W. Griffith as well. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just, uh, it was so much of, I want to bring silent film, um, the silent film world back into the mix in 
the mid 1950s, yeah. 30 years after its peak. So well, that's almost. Yeah, that's that's what's really um, strange about this movie. And, you know, obviously the marquee thing to talk about is Robert Mitchum and his performance. And we'll get to that. But I, f- I was very surprised to find that this was from 1955 mm. because it feels much older than that. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's got the, the not only the visuals as far as the sets and stuff, but the filmmaking style has a real kind of mix of um, modern techniques and older techniques. Because yeah. you've got, you're doing like the, um, what the hell is it called? Well, they zoom down. The, the, the Irish shot. The Irish shot. Yep. Which I think I was reading hadn't been done in a movie since that DP did it on Magnificent Ambersons, which was a handful of years before that. Oh, I didn't I didn't see that, but that, that definitely sounds right. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's shot in, uh, it's not in widescreen, it's in black and white yep. when they were doing like Vista Vision and all that kind of shit yep. at this point. Um, and so it has a, a very kind of old feel to it. And on top of that, the visuals in this movie are absolutely amazing. Mm. Like every single shot in this movie is fantastic just it's like a painting at some points yeah yeah it's just phenomenal and i i didn't know this before i saw it but reading up on it reading that charles lawton was a theater director Mm -hmm. makes a lot of the visual choices make a lot more sense um because you've got and also knowing that he was looking to bring some of that expressionist thing back into it Mm -hmm. because some of those shots where it's um you know the shot of the basement where he's at the top of the stairs, and he's yeah. that feels very much like a like a set for on a play. Mm-hmm. The uh, when they come down the river on the boat to the the house and the barn, mm-hmm. those feel very much like expressionistic yep. um, sets for a for a theatrical production. Yep. So there's a lot of that stuff built into it. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And I also I forget where I saw this or heard it, but part of the minimalism of certain sets Mm -hmm. was designed to be from the perspective of the kids who really don't notice a lot of the details and things like that. I don't remember exactly where I read that, but I, I had that in mind watching it um, again and uh, I could certainly see where that stands out because things like the, the children's bedroom and stuff, there's like, there's nothing in there except the bed for instance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And um yeah, as they're as they're going down the river, they see the barn and the house, and you know all the other things that probably would be there aren't. <laughs> right. It. Uh, yeah. It's it's really it's really interesting how minimalistic the sets are at certain points and how warped they are at other points. Yes. Yeah. I I think um, they tend. It feels like they tend to get much more warped when. Harry Powell is involved. Yes, yeah. Um, one of my favorite sets is the the bedroom set mm-hmm. that has a very expressionistic kind of that feels like it's right out of Nosferatu or something. That's exactly what came to mind when I was watching it too, especially as he's reaching up with his arm to the moonlight coming in from the window. Yes, it's, it feels straight out of Nosferatu. Yeah, I'm yeah. surprised they didn't cut to when he turns around with the knife. I'm surprised they didn't cut to. Uh, a shot of Shelley Winters with the shadow of his hand going up her, <laughs> her body, like in Nosferatu. Yeah, or the um, the eyes that move before the head turns, kind oh, of thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, and all of that stuff leads to, as you were saying, it, it has it's sort of presented through the eyes of the kids, mm-hmm. and the whole thing has a very um, fairy tale like quality. Very as much. Amanda would say in her notes that she sent. Um, it has a warped fairy tale quality just adjacent to a half remembered dream. It's beautiful. I like that. Yeah. Put it on the box. <laughs> Actually, um one of the films that it reminded me of too was uh Beauty and the Beast, the yes. Jean Cocteau yeah. one. Um I got a lot of that feel uh when watching this, the parallel between the fairy tale aspect mm-hmm. and the surrealism that's surrounding a lot of the fairy tale aspect. Yeah. It um I, I got I I couldn't help feel like that might have been an influence to Lawton as well. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting movie because I've only seen that once and I think I might have slept through a lot of it. <clears throat> um but people reference that all the time. Mm-hmm. People don't reference this movie all the time. This I I, I it comes up. But yep. anytime someone is like, 
you know, something, something dreamlike. It's always, well, it's like Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast. Mm-hmm. And, or Un- Unchin and yeah, or something yeah, like that. Anytime yeah. somebody gets their eye cut open. Yeah. Um, but this is a different type of dreamlike because mm-hmm. as cool as Cocteau's movie is, it's old. Mm-hmm. Not that it's a bad thing, but it's like it's older yep. and it's very French. Mm-hmm. This is expressly, explicitly American. Yes. Like this is a very American fairy tale. Mm-hmm. It definitely is. Um, I mean, I think the big bad wolf is the big parallel that people draw. Sure. To Harry yeah. Powell. Yeah. So uh, as I was going to say to describe to describe Harry Powell in this movie. I don't know if you remember the trailer for the Miami Vice movie. Oh, goodness. That was was often um, kind of parodied because of the line at, in, where Colin Farrell says, do you understand the meaning of the word foreboding? And then he gives this like hackneyed. It's yeah. a really weird line. It's not in the actual movie. But that was the first thing that I thought of when I was watching this because I was like, that's the only way I can describe most of this movie. <laughs> is do you understand the meaning of the word foreboding and then you say that's what this movie is okay um harry powell's character is just he's this looming presence Mm -hmm. that kind of you know if you really want to draw an extremely tenuous connection to horror movies has the same kind of energy as like a michael myers who it's like he's constantly chasing them this happens in the later part of the movie but yeah he has that sense of almost being able to teleport yeah, because he's always just right behind them, even though there's, you know, there's no way he'd be able to track them realistically or be there the way that the at the speed that he is. Yeah, but he somehow he manages to be there, and he's just, you know, you've, you've got similar shots to like in Halloween where you got Michael standing among the bushes or across the street. You get some great shots of Harry Powell. That first shot where he, um, he's standing at the in, under the lamplight yep and his shadow is thrown through the window of the kid's bedroom Mm -hmm. it's fantastic his his introduction yeah Yeah. that's like a freddy krueger shot yeah exactly and to your exact point they even call it out in the movie when when they call him freddy krueger yes no (laughs) (laughs) um when the kids are on the run and they're sleeping in the barn and um i always forget the boy's name john yes john sees him on the horizon and says something to the effect of doesn't he ever sleep yeah. he is relentless in his pursuit of them almost to the point of being superhuman yeah yeah so. yeah and he's um well I, I guess to talk about him would be to talk about robert mitchum mm-hmm. in his performance what what is mitchum is a big figure in film noir right enormous yes he's up there in in most people's circles, I would I would say he's up there with Humphrey Bogart. He's up there with Edward G. Robinson in terms of the most influential leading men in film noir. Yeah, it's you know it's 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 a little unfortunate because I feel like as as time goes on, these icons get um, stripped down to the most memorable, mm-hmm. and I feel like he is kind of falling away a bit. Bogart is looms large over everybody. Agreed. Yeah, and I feel like. Mitchum is I have being not steeped in film noir the way that you are Mm -hmm. I have never immediately thought of Robert Mitchum as oh he's a film noir guy yeah but every time I see one of these movies pop up it's always him like he's in all of these movies. he's in so many um I recently watched when strangers marry that was one of his earlier ones and that's that's the the Netflix series right that's about it's a reality show. People have never met each other dating. And being uh, no, I have not seen that show. But it's not. It's not ninety day fiance. No, 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 no. Different one than that. Um, but yeah, that that was an interesting one because I didn't realize he was in it until after I got it. Mm-hmm. And um, then he's in nineteen forty seven. He's in both Crossfire and Out of the Past, which are two of the most important um, film noirs of the late forties. And then he's he's just in so many different things throughout and and even past the point where we're talking about 1958 to 1960 where the classic era is wrapping up he's in Cape Fear in oh, 1962 yeah. which is kind of a play on this a little bit very much so i think yeah. i think the character obviously gets even um I, I don't know who, who's worse but <laughs> yeah i you know it's i always mix up the tattoo thing yeah, because every time I think of it, I think of Cape Fear, 
And it's, yeah, it, but what it's obviously from this one. Yes, and actually, I think that was I heard that on the commentary as well. They called it out because in the remake of Cape Fear um, with Robert De Niro as Max Cady mm-hmm. or Max Cody, um, covered in tattoos. Yeah. But I'm not sure whether or not the Robert Mitchum version of that character in 1962 version has any tattoos. I, I don't to, I remember. I have to go back and re- rewatch it. I don't remember shirtless Robert Mitchum doing pull-ups in in the prison in that one. So. <laughs> but wow. yeah, and then and then he's even. I mean, he's got um, a big place in neo noir in the 70s. He plays. Uh, he's one of the people that uh, reprised the role of. Um, Marlo. I was going to say he played Marlo. Yeah. yeah, and he's in the Friends of Eddie Coyle and great movie, phenomenal movie. Um, and, and most just, notably because they shoot a chase scene at the Melrose Oak Grove tea yes. station. Yeah, it, it's still. I lost my mind the first time I saw that because that's like 15 minutes from my house, and I've taken yep. that train a million times, and I was like, "Is that Melrose? <laughs> is that Oak Grove?" It it is so much fun. That's st- still my favorite Boston based movie. Yeah, yeah. I've only. I, I own that. I've only watched it once. I keep meaning to go back to watch it again, but it's so sad. <laughs> yeah. The, the ending was so depressing. Um, so uh, w- was this movie a departure for him, or is this kind of in line with the kind of characters that he would play um, at the in, time? In terms of his earlier film noir stuff, I think this was more of a shift. I'm not sure if this was the beginning of a shift towards the real evil, sinister person Hmm. um, that he takes on here. And again, in Cape Fear, he might've had a few others prior where he began making, he began making that shift. Um, But if you were to compare it to his stuff from the forties, it is definitely a big turn. Yeah. Um, And this character is, like he's an all-time scumbag. Yeah, I think he's I think he's pretty high up there on the AFI top 100 villains list. Yes. Um yeah. I think he was in the 20s, which might be low. <laughs> yeah, he probably be pretty high, higher yeah. than that. Um but yeah, it's um his his um performance in it is so good that at least for me several times I really forgot I was watching Robert Mitchum because he just he takes that character on so well yeah. that even, you know, an actor that you've seen in 10, 15, 20 movies, you can be lost in it at points. Yeah. He's very unnerving. Yeah. Even, even now it's not, it, it's uh Amanda commented saying uh, he's, he's hilariously ominous without being completely over the top. Yeah. A lesser performance would have involved a lot more screaming or talking through gritted teeth. And yeah. that's he he does get close to being arch, but he mm-hmm. never really crosses over. And so yeah. he stays in this he hangs in this like free fall of kinda silly, but not silly enough where I don't find him threatening. Yeah, there are a couple points that are almost um almost like they're going for a tiny bit of comedy. Um almost yeah. like cartoonish reactions to a few things. Um and the the basement scene that you were talking about that looks like um, could be right off of a Broadway play, for instance, mm. when he's chasing them up the stairs with the arms outright outreach. Oh, sure. I mean, that to me was very um, uh, obviously not too realistic mm. um, and had huge hints of silent film acting sure where yeah. things had to be a lot more overtly acted out yep um it's got a bit of that um over exaggerated hitchcock thing that he'll do from time to time like where um sam loomis falls down the stairs in psycho yep it's like humans don't fall like that yep. like it's just this weird you know camera in the face thing and while the guy's waving his arms yep. with a screen behind him that is a camera going down a set yeah, of stairs and you, and you hear the footsteps going so much faster than humanly possible yes <laughs> yeah it's 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 this weird kind of um stylistic choice to show this moment that is makes it almost more um disorienting yeah disorienting i think is a great word and just it's so far from realism it's it's keeping you in that dream world yeah 
because you know it just is it's it's on that side of this really wouldn't happen this way mm. and um by doing that by by using that along with all the other expressionistic tones that are that are used throughout the film which are really based in the whole idea of not showing things in their true nature in mm. their true reality um that's just one of the things that keeps this fairy tale story just unattainable and 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 you just you can't really it's tough to put yourself in it because you know that at a certain point it's not real yes yeah you know i was watching this this is going to be a, a sound like a strange comparison but bear with me okay the movie that i thought of immediately when finishing this was death proof the quentin tarantino movie i have not seen that okay well i'm gonna ruin it for you a little bit okay go for it <coughs> excuse me um <clears throat> death proof is about uh kurt russell plays stuntman mike okay who's this guy who gets his jollies ki- he's a serial killer who kills women with his car okay and he enjoys uh playing with them like a very kind of cat and mouse thing you know um and he enjoys their fear and, he, and he's got he he puts a huge big masculine front on mm-hmm. until the moment where the tables turn and the girls shoot him and he like he gets shot in the shoulder from that point on he s- turns into like a sniveling baby like wimp of a character like screaming and crying and mm-hmm. like his his whole he's been completely emasculated and i th- was that occurred to me watching this because it there's this same um, Harry Powell has the same kind of um, mask of intense uh, masculine power that once so- once someone finally stands up to him, just like crumbles mm-hmm. because he's got you know he's clearly preys on children. Mm-hmm. Like the first shot of the movie is implied to be his doing, where you they, these kids find. I believe it's another child. No, I is that think, is that the, I think like that it was his... supposed to be another widow. Oh, okay. Well, either I, way, I think I'm not sure, but there's it, there's a either very one, heavily so, someone that was susceptible to. Yeah, yeah, and there's a very heavily implied kind of you know don't leave this guy with your kids kind of vibe. Yeah, as much as you probably could in 1955. Um, but he likes to control these women mm-hmm. with his words, like he's he's very much not touching them sexually, but he does enjoy the power that he gets yeah and he very clearly hates women especially women who are you know modern let's use that as a euphemism yeah um because the 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 scene with the literal pocket knife he's at a burlesque show Mm -hmm. and basically every woman who doesn't listen to him he calls a whore and he wants to kill them yeah yeah um misogynistic should have been one of the adjectives i used when first referencing him yes in the synopsis um uh, but yeah, it's his his character is um, like you said, so masculine. And when you when you mention um, bulletproof is the name of it, death proof, death proof, death proof. Um, I mean, it just jumped out to me. It's it's almost to a T exactly what happens when yeah. he actually gets uh, shot by Lillian Gish. Right, he makes those sc- right. screaming, um, uh, you know, completely emasculine yeah just howls noises. and runs yeah. how he sounds like uh judge doom at the end of roger rabbit <laughs> a weird pull for this moment yeah yeah i wouldn't uh i wouldn't i wouldn't pull that uh together <laughs> that's what that's what we do here yeah um but yeah it's he 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 wields this power that is completely unchecked and nobody stands up to him mm-hmm. and even the townspeople are very quickly enthralled by him. Yep. Um, and then finally at the end when you get Rachel, who's the one person who's like, eh, this, fuck this guy, yep. and and stands up to him, he completely crumbles. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's also interesting to me is how, like you said, he has the whole town wrapped around his finger at the beginning and um, the married couple that, the spoons, mm-hmm. 
Um, they're obviously the the husband kind of kind of feels like there's something up with him. The wife is enamored with him, um, and you know he he commands that picnic scene by yeah. the river and everything like that. Um, how quickly it turns into the lynching mob mentality afterwards? Yes, very es- fast, especially. Um, I forget her first name, but Mrs. Mrs. Spoon. Icy. Icy. Icy name. Spoon. Yes. <laughs> um, awesome name. That's a good name. Um, but she, that is like, you almost can't even believe that that's the same character from 45 minutes earlier. Yeah. Because she turns into like almost this completely deranged, violent, um, you know, string him up type character. Yeah. And, uh, total mob mentality and uh, she was probably the the one who was susceptible to his charms quote unquote right uh, the most earlier well, in the movie she's a person of extremes right because yeah. she very quickly says to willa whose husband has just died you know what you should marry this guy he seems great and like really forces that yeah and then on the other end of the on the other end of the spectrum when the tables turn she is very vocal about stringing this guy up yeah so yeah it seems like she at the very least is a person who has her own uh, amount of sway yeah and is quick to like you said go to the extreme once she's made up her mind yes (laughs) yes uh speaking of willa it's uh, shelly winters who is a, a she's an actress whose name i know but i don't really know a lot of stuff she's been in was she in a, a lot of film noir stuff around this time um, so she was in a film noir with John Garfield, um, and um, he ran all the way. I don't know why that was taking me a while to, to think of it, but he was. And he was in that. She was in that with John Garfield. Um, she was also in. Um, I'm I'm blanking. Don't worry about it. I'm blanking on it, but uh, yeah, she was she was definitely in a few noirs, but uh, she was one that came into the scene definitely not at the beginning of the noir cycle. She was you know late 40s, early 50s Mm -hmm. is when she started to have some noir appearances. Yeah, her character I find fascinating because she is she doesn't seem like someone who should be so easily persuaded, Mm -hmm. but she clearly is. I mean, because again, basically all it takes is a little push from Icy to be like, you know what? You probably shouldn't be alone. You should probably. And then she's like, you know what? Yeah, maybe you're right. Like, so, and which then leads into her relationship with Harry, Mm -hmm. which is that kind of thing times a thousand. Yeah. Because he just, you know, has an iron grip on her. Yeah, and she's very quick, even in their their um, wedding night, she's very quick to say, you know, listen to what his craziness that night, and then say, and then go with it. Yeah. Saying, you know, almost a prayer at the end, help me get clean and, and be the person that, that he wants me to be. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Her, if, the scene where right before she dies is really interesting, because it's almost like, Harry's thing backfires a little bit Mm -hmm. because I think she says something like she realizes that John knows where the money is Mm -hmm. and her response is like it doesn't God has told me that it doesn't even matter where the money is and and you could see Harry be like no it matters where the money is (laughs) yeah yeah. you serve no more use to me so I'm just gonna get rid of you yeah Um, and then the the spotlight effect on her when she's laying in the bed right before that happens yeah very uh, another big homage to silent film yeah it almost looks like she's just laying in a coffin kind of yeah and that's sh- man that shot where they find her in the water yeah unbelievable so surrealistic so cool looking the one thing i didn't like about that mm-hmm. and um it's such a scary shot too yeah. um but the one thing i didn't like is when they show the uncle and he is fishing mm-hmm. and he sees the model yeah, t it's like and the water is clear as it's like as clear as day Bermuda. and it's like it's like 12 feet deep yeah. well that's what i was thinking i was watching i was like this is really cool how the hell did he get that car all the way out there i know that was the thing it was like it if they never had that part of it and yeah. they just kept it with the underwater shots 
and her hair going in the water and everything, mm-hmm. it would have been just, I think, just so more powerful because once you see that, you're like, oh, that's silly. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like she's at the bottom of a swimming pool. Exactly. Instead yeah. of a muddy lake or whatever. It's like, how in the world is he the first person to see this? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, with her out of the way, the, the focus really moves to the kids. Mm-hmm. And I think the kids are are really great. Um, the kid who plays John, yeah. I think, is fantastic. Billy Chapin, I think, is his name. Yeah. yeah. The, the, and his older brother's in it, too. Oh, yeah? His older brother is one of the kids um, in the quote-unquote city oh um, yeah he kind of looks like i think i know which one you're talking about yeah yeah leaning like. leaning against the brick wall um when they first go in and like right see that part of the city which right. is something we can talk about too the role of that city in terms of corrupting oh sure um the the youth of yeah. this movie um well yeah he's he's great i i think they there's a lot of stuff in this movie that i wasn't ready for stylistically Mm -hmm. that he kind of has to he's kind of got it on his shoulders to to make a lot of this work yes like there's some there's a great shot where um or great sequence where he asks it's early on when harry shows up and harry's like oh your father told me what happened to the money and he's like oh yeah what did he say and he's like he said he tied it to a rock and threw it in the river and they cut back to the kid and he gives this like quick smirk Mm -hmm. because he knows that this guy's lying yep which is the kind of subtlety you don't usually get from younger actors especially in this era yeah and i actually remember on the commentary of the kino lorber 4k that i watched um for this the commentator was talking about the fact that robert mitchum was helping direct um, oh, really? the kids yeah. in a lot of the scenes um i think that f- from what i read maybe charles lawton was a little less confident in terms of his directorial ability mm-hmm. so robert mitchum was almost like helping its, sure. uh direct the the ch- child actors in some of the scenes mm-hmm. so um not a not a bad coach to have obviously no. yeah i had, i had read that lawton liked working with chapin but he really didn't like the girl <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, she seems based on her performance she seems almost too young yeah it's it definitely seems like but that. they get a lot of really interesting stuff out of her yeah and i think her performance ultimately ends up being um <clears throat> unrealistic isn't like a I don't mean that in a negative way, but there's something kind of disjointed and weird about her performance that makes it work yeah. inside this already heightened framework. Exactly. Again, it's, it, she's like she's like a five year old David Lynch actor, kind of. Yes, where um you can definitely tell that it's a child trying to act and be be that character. Yeah. Um but in this setting of um suspending your disbelief to what you're seeing it works yeah yeah it really does and and her um she has a lot of weird mood swings Mm -hmm. as far as uh you know what she's afraid of who she's afraid of who she cares about yeah you know you get this really strange ending where after you've spent an hour and a half watching these kids run from harry powell she goes to him. when he gets arrested yeah. she freaks out yeah and they the, the both of them have this kind of flashback to their father being arrested yeah which is just like geez, call your therapist for everybody yeah i know seriously <laughs> yeah but it's um i i think it's extremely interesting too because before when he first shows up mm-hmm. at Rachel's house uh her reaction is to go to him with outstretched arms. Right, yeah. And the last time that she saw him was when he was chasing them through the muddy riverbank and screaming bloody murder as they uh, extended beyond his reach down the river. Right. Um, Which was only just after he chased them up the stairs trying to get them. Yeah, (laughs) it's... It's it's, it's not... You kind of find have this weird sensation of she doesn't totally know what's going on. Yeah. Um, or I don't. I don't know. I mean, maybe they're trying to say something about kids. I don't know. Yeah. 
it, possibly the whole fairy tale yeah. aspect and in a sense of of um, you know not understanding the evils of life kind sure. of thing. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, her her doll is a huge part. It's got the money inside it. Mm-hmm. I you know it's one of those things where I think when you've got movies like this that are very stylistically cool, that doesn't necessarily mean that as far as storytelling visually, Mm -hmm. they're going to be good. Because, you know, a great set, you shoot a great set, that's great, but what what are you doing with the stuff? Yep. I think this movie's fantastic as far as storytelling goes. Yep. Especially, I think one of my favorite moments is probably the reveal of where the money is, Mm -hmm. where she's making the paper dolls out of it, which yeah. is a great way to show that she doesn't really know what's going on here. Exactly. She understands the promise that she made yeah. not to say anything, but she doesn't understand the significance of what's behind that promise kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And then you get the great moment when Harry comes out and they've shoved all the money back into the doll. Mm-hmm. You see the two paper dolls flip yeah. past his feet. Past his feet wind. and he doesn't notice. Yeah, yeah. It remind, that reminded me of, I've been watching a lot of Hitchcock movies lately and that yeah. seemed very much like something that he would do because it, it, it kind of it feels like his structure a bit where mm-hmm. you've got the suspense of who is this guy, where is the money and then at a certain point he gives you the answer yep. and so they tell you where the money is and then from that point on it becomes... When is this guy going to find out where the money is? And that's where the suspense comes from. Exactly. He turns it back to the audience. Rather than being a mystery, it's it's all about watching it unfold. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, one of the things that stood out to me here is, and I don't know if this was me just watching an older movie with more modern sensibilities, but I was really surprised that this didn't end, well, a couple places. <clears throat> I was surprised that the chase from of Harry and the kids continued down the river as far as it did. Mm-hmm. Um, we could start there. Because like that's it, the way that the movie felt paced, based on my modern understanding of most movies, is I just assumed that was going to be the whole thing mm-hmm. like if they were going to chase like like any monster movie yeah he was going to chase them they were going to run at some point they were going to have a confrontation going to die or whatever yep <clears throat> and so when they get in the boat and you start of you start of you kind of start into this new act of the film yeah um where it now becomes a more drawn out chase was something i wasn't ready for <clears throat> yeah and to take that to the next step is you get the Lillian Gish character right. as the Rachel next Cooper yeah. who is a huge character and you don't see her until an hour into the movie. Yeah. Um, that whole section like from the when they get in the boat up through when he gets arrested could be its own movie. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, that it's it's almost like that that first act like you were just saying up to the point where they escape in the boat and then you have a little bit of a in terms of duration it's a little bit shorter between Mm -hmm. then and getting to rachel's house but that middle act of them going down the river and him chasing especially with you know the silhouette shots and um so much of it taking place at night you have the animals on the banks of of the river to me that is the 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 real time where you're like okay now we're we're in a fairy tale right right yeah um, and yeah, as, as they were breaking this in, <clears throat> excuse me, into these different sections, I, I did wonder if this was based on a book mm-hmm. because it seems a bit more structured like a book, especially, um, in the first section in the town when he's married to the wife, to the, to the mother, they get into a little bit of this idea that he's sort of like a, a like a bit of a cult leader. Mm hmm. <clears throat> where he's doing this sort of revival preaching stuff and the the mom is talking about the way she sinned and he's got all these these this congregation and stuff. Yeah, that that tent scene with the torches yeah. and everything. And yeah. it's it's a really quick scene. Yeah. And it never really comes back again. And in my head I was like, yeah, I mean, I feel like if this was like a different movie, that would be a big part of the middle of the movie. Yeah. And then you would probably end it with him chasing the kids. But here that's a bit kind of um compact. Yeah. 
and then they've got this whole kind of middle section that's them going down the river, which is kind of its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would I would put that together with the Rachel sequence, but yeah. Rachel's a really interesting character again because she's she is this sort of counterpoint to Harry as far as her approach towards children, where where Harry is very much. Um, as he says, uh, uh, I serve the religion, the good Lord and me cooked up between us, yep. which may, means absolutely nothing. Yeah. Uh, Rachel is a little bit more um, practical in her wielding of- And by the book. By the book. Yeah. Whereas Harry's using all this stuff as a cover, as an excuse. You know, that's why he's like- Exactly, yeah. You want me to kill another woman, Lord? It's like, nah, that's not how that works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's just using that as, as a an excuse to do whatever- evil thing he wants to do yeah so uh but yeah the the rachel character is it's almost like the the character embodiment of his whole good versus evil thing and the whole right. theme that runs through the the movie all the way down to his tattoos right it's i mean love she becomes is love versus she hate. is yeah. love and he is hate basically and what happens in the movie is the story of his tattoos for the most part it's a it's a really great point yeah because um yeah it's i I, I don't even know what to say about it because it, it just becomes um it's it takes that fairy tale and it takes these just like ancient ideas of good and evil and then puts it into this so artistically stylized story. Yeah. Um that could only be I mean, it could really only be done by a first time filmmaker, I feel. I mean Yeah. It's I, I I draw a lot of similarities between this and Citizen Kane, actually. Sure, sure. Um, and down to the cinematographer, Stanley Cortez, who worked with Orson Welles on The Magnificent Ambersons. Right. Um, so there is that direct link as well. But you have this first-time filmmaker who's coming in to tell this non-traditional story and has so many fantastic ideas is influenced by silent film yep. and wants to pay homage to it. And obviously they both manifest in a very expressionistic way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's almost like um, the, it's not like naivete, but it's like brand new thoughts and brand new perspective to try and try some new stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it it's, it's interesting how, how similarly it plays out, I think, in terms of what the first time filmmaker is able to convey and and what happens on the screen, yeah, based off of their new kind of vision. And you get that thing too. I think it. Um, what's the name of the DP for Susan Kane? Greg Toland. Toland. Yeah, I think Toland said about working with Orson Welles, which was he doesn't know what can't be done. Yes, and so exactly. He's willing to try anything. Exactly. Which is the same kind of thing, which I think you know, you need to, I think a lot of people might take that the wrong way and not understand that you need to have artistic sensibility first. Mm-hmm. Um and that doesn't just mean if you're completely ignorant you can do whatever you want. <clears throat> but these guys Orson Welles, Charles Lawton, big theater guys. Yep. They understand theatricality, they understand uh drama. And the way that they choose to show that visually on screen is sort of run through, has to run through a bit of a filter Mm -hmm. that is someone else's filter and not their own understanding of shooting a hundred movies and being like, well, we just do shot reverse shot, but it's easy if we do this. But they're going to be the ones who be like, sure, I know we can't do that, but what if we did? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of like the opposite of, somebody that comes to mind is like a Howard Hawks that just knows how things are done in right, the industry. Right. Um, I find, and- I find that stuff so interesting as well. Cause you hear these different guys talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Orson Welles, someone like Orson Welles is, um, he's much more romantic about it, but he also knows how this stuff works. Oh you yeah. Know? Like he's a realist to a certain extent, but he's, he's a romantic realist. Whereas Howard Hawks, any or like John Ford, all these guys are just like, I don't understand why anybody would want to do it. You put the camera here, it works. You put the camera here, it doesn't work. 
I don't care what these. I don't care much for this strange stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Uh, I I think the other interesting thing too between the the comparison you made with Tolan is that uh, Stanley Cortez was very established. Uh, his his pedigree was um, mostly horror. He had a oh, little. Really? He had, he had a there little bit of. Um, I mean, I say that like I knew it off the top of my head. I did not I have to look it up, but. Well. <laughs> um, but he also had well, a little bit of a... that's different from me. Most yeah. of the stuff I say, I just make up. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, he um, he was mostly horror. He did have a few forays into film noir. Um, he did um, he did the Underworld story, and later on he did The Naked Kiss. That came out in the 60s. Mm. Um, but so he had a little bit of a, hor- a horror, or a little bit of a noir um, touch to him, but mostly horror. But very much an established DP who knew how to do things when the rubber met the road. So you have this innovative mind of Lawton being balanced by this practicalist who can actually tell him what can be done and what can't be done. Sure. Um, Very similar to Orson Welles coming in with all these ideas. And Greg Toland is the real pro who is able to say that's an awesome idea we could try that kind of thing right or that's a little too too far to go it's just not possible in this medium kind of thing yeah yeah that that stuff is always so fun too like like orson wants to show the ceiling Mm -hmm. none of these sets have ceilings we've never done that how do we do that well if you know if we put a scrim over the thing which is porous enough that we can put a microphone in there it's like okay Sure, let's give it a shot. Yeah, I, I remember hearing... Dig a s- hole in the bottom of the set. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it, literally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember hearing something about... Um, it was a... I think it was a director, uh, an, an older school director along like the Howard Hawks, John Ford school kind of saying, um, talking with Orson Welles, and they're talking about a particular scene. They're like, okay, um, but you want you want the person to exit stage left and there's no door there like why don't you just have him exit stage right and his response was something to the effect of well in my mind it's left so let's build a door yeah <laughs> hey why not simple simple solution exactly like ra- rather than rather than change the idea uh for something that probably didn't matter he would have them reconstruct the set yeah <laughs> image is everything um, so yeah, we get into the Rachel stuff and that we meet these other border kids mm-hmm. that she's taking care of, including, is it Ruby? Ruby. Ruby. Yes. Who's, um, the oldest, the oldest. Yeah. Trying to think of a euphemism for her, uh, <clears throat> budding adolescence. Yeah. Um, and she is sort of this, this character Ruby becomes this sort of interesting go between mm. of someone who is being, a girl who is old enough, who is still part of this, um, of Rachel's flock, so to speak. Yeah. But who is being lured away by the, the temptations of the city. Yep. Um, and her reaction to Harry Powell is very interesting as well, because even after she kind of freaks out when he shows up at the house, she's also still like, you know, fanning herself every time he shows up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like, um, is she, does she exist in this story just for um, Harry Powell to be able to get back into this kind of thing? Mm. Um, it's I, I would like to. Um, I'm very interested to to read the book eventually. I've heard yeah. it is is quite good. Um, I would be interested to see um, if how, how her her character is played in that as well. But yeah, like you said, she is. You know. She's the oldest of this group. She's being lured by the temptation of, you know, quote unquote, adult life, the city, the neons, everything like that, you know, falling in love. Um, And she uh, she meets him in the city and then, you know, is is quick to to go have ice cream with him and everything like that. So, yeah. um, And then she plays a key. She plays a key uh, part in the climactic scene when she comes down with the candle and reveals where Rachel is sitting in the dark. That's a to, great. That's a great sequence. Oh my goodness, yeah. it's so good. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's like she serves to move the story forward, um, and you know the, you couldn't get to the end with without her. Yeah. Um, but at, at the same point, she does have this completely. There's no other character like her in this movie by far. Yeah, yeah, and I I love their depiction, their shorthand for the city, which is just brick buildings and some neon signs yeah it's really all you need a, a restaurant neon that is in the middle of a brick wall yes that has, where there's no restaurant there <laughs> yeah it's yeah. um yeah it, it's uh it's not not to go back again to um the the book by Imogen sarah smith but her book in lonely places a lot of it is talking about how noir is so much around the city yeah and a lot of times it's easy to forget how many noirs are set in either the suburbs or in rural places and what the role of the city plays in those stories. And that, I think that's very evident here because we have, you know, a, a country home um, of Rachel Cooper and then, you know, where's the bad guy? He's he's in the city. Right. Um, where's where's she lying? She's lying saying that she's going to sewing lessons in the city right. and that's where she's, you know, trying to fall in love, um, you know, grow up, what, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's super interesting that they used it that way and they felt the need to not really create a city, just give you the, yeah. indi- just give you the feel of a city. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the shorthand, shorthand for stuff like that goes a long way yeah you you only i um this is a bit of off topic but i watching these hitchcock movies Mm -hmm. the thing that's been standing out to me is how many matte paintings he uses oh yeah and i was watching a uh (coughs) excuse me i was watching a youtube video talking about um cgi use and special effects use over the years and they had so many examples from his movies where you've got like full frame shots, a famous one from um, Torn Curtain, mm-hmm. where Paul Newman is walking through this really big, sprawling hall. I think it's like a um, museum. Yep. And on this video, they showed the actual amount of set that was built, which was just enough for Paul Newman to walk on and just enough to cover his head in the line that he walked on. And mm-hmm. the rest of the room was a painting. And I was like, Jesus Christ, man, these, you know, it's, I feel if Hitchcock was still alive, I bet he would use CGI like crazy. Yeah. You know, probably, I don't know if he would use it the way some people use it, but he would have no qualms about artificial CGI backgrounds and stuff. He would love the volume, that thing that they use now. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. But there's something to be said about shorthand for this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where expressionism works so well as a storytelling device. Yeah. Because you can shorthand the city, a couple buildings, especially when most of your movie takes place on a farm, mm-hmm. or farms, uh, plural, a couple brick buildings and a couple neon lights, things you're not going to find out in, out in the sticks, mm-hmm. it reads as a city immediately. Yeah. And, and that's, I think- It's all necessary, like you said. Yeah. There's some of these movies that always, they always strike me with- how they're photographed and the the storytelling through the images, um, these older black and white movies, like um, this one is a lot in Citizen Kane. And uh, have you seen The Innocents? I have not. No, I'll send you home with that one. That's a good one. Okay, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but there's a certain there's certain qualities that stand out to me as a comic book artist Mm -hmm. where i look at some of these shots and i go this looks like a comic book page yeah like a like a really well done comic book panel the way that they're choosing how to spot their blacks what stuff they're putting in light what stuff they're putting in darkness the scene with rachel sitting with the gun with harry outside Mm -hmm. that's a could be a comic book panel oh yeah you know and it's the my one of my favorites from citizen kane is when uh after he talks to Kane's ex-wife. Yep. The guys on the on the phone in the phone booth, mm-hmm. and the way the shot is set up, where it's like he's in the phone booth, framed by the, the 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 window of the phone booth, but he's completely in shadow. And then you can see the rest of the room with like the Mater D in the middle ground, and then she's in the background. It's a it's like a perfectly composed shot. Yeah. Also with um, I'm gonna need to keep spewing all this stuff out. No, but, go for it. Um, <clears throat> so have you ever seen Son of Frankenstein? 
No. I'll send you home with that too. Okay. <laughs> Son of Frankenstein, unbelievable. It's the movie's fine. Visually, fantastic. Huh. And there are multiple shots in that movie where I'm like, this looks like a painting, like a really fantastic black and white, you know, comic book page, if you will, but like a, you know, expressionistic painting. It, they're, Interesting. Is that James Whale too? No, that's, I honestly don't know who directed it. Okay. Um, but it's Basil Rathbone. Yeah. Uh, it's the last time Karloff plays the monster. Okay. What's actually interesting is a lot of that movie is Young Frankenstein. Mm. Like if you're familiar with. Yes. You're, yeah. You'll watch that movie and go, oh, that's all Young Frankenstein. Okay. Like the guy, the inspector with the fake arm, <laughs> that all comes from that movie. <laughs> anyway, what the hell are we talking about? Um, Night of the Hunter. Night of the Hunter. Um, so, yeah. So you've got the, the stuff with Rachel. Um, you, you get this sort of showdown sequence where she shoots him. This is the point where I was really surprised the movie kept going. I couldn't agree more. I wish it would have ended. It's a like I was trying to figure out like what they were getting from continuing forward. And uh, it was another thing where I was like this just must be how the book ends. Mm. Cuz it feels like that. Yeah. Y- you know, movies don't generally especially I don't want to generalize, but I feel like a lot of movies back then don't have those kinds of codas on them. Mm. Um, it's usually get in, get out as quickly as possible. And this seems like one where after you have your bookend scene of the kids reacting, I guess it's tough, right? <clears throat> because if you end it with Harry getting arrested, you end it in kind of a downer. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you keep going the way they do, you get a much more optimistic ending. Yeah, I mean, they literally turn it into a Christmas movie for the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, don't start the argument whether or not Night of the Hunter is a Christmas movie, because we've all had that argument with everyone we know on the (laughs) Internet. It's one of the (laughs) Internet's favorite arguments. Yeah. Um, But I I think I was going to say that it's um, it's so interesting that they do it. And it's another reason why I would like to read the book and see how that plays out in it, like you said, because it might just be that that's the way that the book ends. Yeah. Um, But turning it into that feel good Christmas ending and turning the turning the town against him with the mob mentality almost a la frankenstein i was gonna say yeah I, when we talk about whether or not this is a horror movie yeah it sure ends like one it, it absolutely <laughs> does with a I mob mean, of anger villagers it, yeah it, that 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 mob of people is just frankenstein all over yes and yeah. um it's it, like you said it's it's tough because it would be a real downer if it ended with john um, you know, hit, hitting him with the doll and the money coming out saying, I didn't want any of this in the first place. Yeah. Um, that would be a very downbeat ending. Um, I'm not sure whether or not it would have been better, but it just, that, that last 10 minutes just seems out of place to me. Yeah. I, I almost feel like you could cut, like if you wanted to put the happy ending on there, I feel like you could cut out like the trial and stuff mm. and just jump to Christmas. Yeah. You know, and just get to their a happy family. Now he gives her an apple for Christmas and she pretends she likes it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's <clears throat> kind of how I would feel about it too. And although I, there is interesting stuff in that little coda, like the, the they, they sneak him out the back door when, when the mob is coming for him and they kind of turn on the kids. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out why that was, is it because they don't testify against him? It's, I don't. I think it was just John they put up in the uh, in the chair on the stand, and he didn't say anything. Yes. Right. And um, I, I'm not sure if they put um, Pearl up there as well, but yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting as well because you you have this complete turn, and then. It, it comes full circle again, really, where it comes back to the same person who executed the father. Right. Yeah. And this time he's saying this will be a pleasure to, to execute this person. Yeah. Um, in reference to Harry, obviously. 
Um, so it, it comes full circle in that regard, just like the arrest came full circle. Yeah. Yeah. I would be curious because all of that stuff feels like makes more sense in a longer book or some mm. book length yeah. thing. And what I what I heard or read too was that the original screenplay by Tom uh, James Agee was ridiculously. It was long. like three hundred pages yeah. or something, right? It, I think they said it was going to be like a six hour movie if it yeah. was shot the way it was written. Yeah. Um, and that was when Charles Lawton um, took that and distilled it down into his his work, really. Right. Yeah. Um, so, who who knows how true that original screenplay was to the book? Yeah. Um, jumping back just for a second to the, to the kind of, um, rural Gothic thing that they're doing. I would be interested to know, have you seen the movie Pearl? Came out, Um, came out like last year or the year before. No, I didn't. So it's, uh, it's, there's the series of movies being made by this director, Ty West. The first one's called X. Mm -hmm. Then the sequel, the next one, which is a prequel and is actually about the, quote unquote monster of the movie X. It's yep. called Pearl. And which is of course the name of the young girl in this. Yep. I would act I was wondering last night whether or not this movie was an influence on Pearl because Pearl is very I would say has a lot in common with the style of this movie. It's about a girl it's more it, it's more like if Ruby was the main character. Okay. And it's kind of <clears throat> Ruby is is stuck on the farm. She wants to be a star, and that kind of turns ends up. She ends up deteriorating into a murderer, mm. um, and she's like completely um, has delusions of grandeur and all this kind of stuff. It's I think it's a really great movie, but it's it it has a similar kind of gothic, um, urban not urban rural gothic kind of thing going on. Yeah, that this does, and I'd be. I'd be interested to know if, if Night of the Hunter was an influence on that, which obviously is not something either of us could answer, so why bring it up? Um, I think it's actually great to bring up because one of the things that, the enduring legacy of this movie, it did have an influence on some really important filmmakers. Mm. Um, I Whether or not it was an influence on Pearl, I don't know, but um, Spike Lee, oh, right. Do the Right Thing. Yep. Um, Raheem. And, yep, and um, the Coen Brothers. Oh sure, absolutely. Yeah. Very much so. And even down to a shared love of you and I, the Big Lebowski. Mm-hmm. Um the abide line. Oh yeah. She, <laughs> she she says it twice in the last That's like true. ninety seconds of the movie. I was wondering why she said the dude abides in this. It didn't make a lot of sense <laughs> in this context. But. Uh yeah, it's 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 so uh it's so interesting because like we I, I have we talked about how much it flopped yet? No, we should talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it was... Before we get into that, yeah. the last thing I want to talk about. I don't know if we've ever on this show really talked about the convention of the angry mob of villagers. Mm-hmm. It's a fascinating thing that permeated a lot of these horror movies. Like, you could trace... I don't know if it goes back before Phantom of the Opera, but I know that that's the earliest one I can think of. I mean, I guess technically you could... Another one you could go, well, uh, technically M did it too, but yeah. Phantom of the Opera, the way Phantom of the Opera ends is with an angry mob of villagers yeah. chasing down the Phantom of the Opera and killing him, basically. Yeah. And from that point on, all these Universal Monster movies end with a bunch of people with torches and pitchforks chasing the monster down and either burning them to death or something. Yeah. It's... To the point where it becomes this cliche. And it's, it, it's an interesting thing in interesting convention for horror movies because traditionally now the end of a horror movie is usually a one-on-one situation Mm -hmm. whereas back then it became a community situation where it kind of expands outward because like you think about frankenstein frankenstein is pretty pretty tight until the monster gets loose Mm -hmm. and then it becomes the community being worked up into a fervor to the point where they want to kill this guy. Yeah. It's I feel like it's it's one of those things that started out as um like the the undertone of it was to create sympathy for the monster to a certain extent because in Frankenstein obviously that's the point. Yeah. 
<clears throat> you could argue whether or not that's the point in Phantom of the Opera. I don't know. But there's something about the mob mentality going after the under the misunderstood character mm-hmm. that makes it a tragic ending for this quote unquote monster. But then that turns into just the the angry mob of villagers hunts down and kills the monster and there's no like subtext to it anymore. Yeah. And here, I know I'm kind of throwing a lot at you here. No, no. I I I'm interested to see where it's going. <laughs> Me too. I have no idea. <laughs> but here here it's kind of it is again playing with this mob mentality thing, but it's something they've been seeding through the whole film. Mm-hmm. Be, through the icy spoon character who is sort of the leader or the the mouthpiece for what the the big shifts in attitude that the people have. Yeah. Um I don't know, that's all I got. I don't really have a thesis, but <laughs> I, I mean I it's it's an I think it's an interesting point. Um because obviously we, we, we talked about Frankenstein, but like you said, M is another real parallel here where you have the villain who is um caught and then, you know, tried in the the criminal kangaroo court um and it becomes a community versus the the villain Mm -hmm. um i never really thought of it being as being um just a storytelling convention of horror but i think you could make that argument quite a bit yeah yeah i guess you know it depends on how where you want to draw the line on it because i think it's kind of a it's well westerns tend to be most of the time end up being sort of a one-on-one situation. But like, I'm trying to think of like, it's not like obviously it exists in other places, but when you think of a bunch of people with pitchforks, you Mm -hmm. think horror movie for the most point. Yeah. You think like universal monster movie. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. It's one of those things where it's, you know, it's um, like an M obviously you've got a situation where, the the person being chased down is pretty objectively a monster, mm-hmm. but there is still that little bit of sympathy you have for a human being being hounded by a hundred people looking to kill them. Yeah, and so it's it's it, it's almost always used in a to bring a little bit of pathos to what's going on. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting to think about. It's it's an interesting dynamic because at, at this point, um, it's been well established in in the Night of the Hunter too that there really is a dichotomy of pure good versus pure evil in this. Right. Um, so maybe it's a departure from that a little bit because Harry Powell is so much representative of pure evil, mm. um, but is there supposed to be some sympathy for? for his character um you know not nearly to the to the point of you know frankenstein or something like that but um it's it's interesting whether or not that is maintained to even give you some um empathy towards towards his situation well what they do here is not something they ever do in monster movies there's never a point where everybody's chasing down frankenstein and then somebody goes well wait a minute what about that guy? Like, yeah, let's go that guy instead. You know, like they don't shift the focus. Mm-hmm. It's very singular. Where in here, they've got this mob of people who are going after Harry, but then they point the same kind of anger at the kids. You know, so I th- and I think it there's, it, I think they're commenting on the idea of mob mentality more here than they do in like Frankenstein or something. But because of how easy, quickly they can shift their the things that they're angry at. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm just bullshitting this stuff, but um, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this was a huge, huge disappointment financially and critically at the time. Financially and critically, um, like you said, Charles Lawton's only sole directorial credit. Mm-hmm. Um, Great batting average, though. Went out on top, one for one. Well, eventually, once yeah. people came around to it, a- exactly. And it was, it's so much resurfaced and is now just so revered Hmm. um i think it went to the national film registry in 1992 so only three years after the initial class of 89 i want to say if i get those years wrong by a few years 
sorry. But um, it, it was getting, early. Getting a it, letter from the AFI. Yeah, it was early. It made it in there, and it's um, it's on a lot of people's greatest films ever list. Yeah, and uh, I think rightfully so. I wonder. Do you know like what the initial response was? So what the negative response was critically, at least. I think I read it. I guess I could look it up too, but I didn't. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think I read one <laughs> tiny thing to actually answer that, and it was um, that it was too artsy. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, it, yeah, this is like mid fifties, where eighty percent of the movies were garbage. It was yeah. just like shitty Technicolor musicals. I mean, like to the conversation we had about Kiss Me Deadly, for instance. Is it the same year? Same year as I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. So it comes out in the same year as Kiss Me Deadly, and I mean, unique in their own regards. Oh yeah, but completely different stylistically. Yeah, even though there is there are hints of expressionism in Kiss Me Deadly. Kiss Me Deadly masquerades as a classic noir much more. He's better than this does. Absolutely. Like the, if you are just looking at the surface of Kiss Me Deadly, there's nothing interesting going on. Yeah, but. The minute you start paying attention to that movie, you're like, wait a minute, this is really weird. <laughs> yeah, it's it. Kiss Me Deadly is is so often talked about as an essential of noir, and Night of the Hunter is usually referenced in noir discussion. Um, but at the same time, it's also recognized as not really a quintessential noir mm. because it's so um, out of the box in certain ways and probably to the whole point of this discussion is why is it on the rotten horror Great top question. 200 question top 200 films list uh top 200 horror movies yeah this is number what did i say 36 i believe i think you, you said that and wasn't it really yeah. high before the last reshuffle who's to say it's I, lost, I, it's lost I, to the sands of I time i know i know it's but i got a feeling it, it was really high at one point because i remember seeing that i'm like yeah Hmm. Would you? And I remember you and Amanda saying at one point too, when you mentioned it before in a in a show, you're like, "Should it be on the list?" Yeah. What, what do you? Well, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about it as a horror movie? How do you feel about it as a noir movie? Um. It's. I was trying to. I I knew you were going to ask me this question, so I was trying to think about that um, on the way here, and I absolutely love it as a horror movie. I absolutely love it as a film noir movie, even though I don't think it fits into either of those categories yeah. very well. Yeah. It is its own thing. Just because, um, I mean, there's surrealism, there's expressionism, there's horror, there's noir, uh, there's fairy tale Disney aspect at a certain sure. point. Um, it is so much its own thing that it's tough to put into... Um, an established box that we tend to talk about when we look at these kind of lists. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I think, I think if it didn't look the way it does, it wouldn't come close. Well, it's easy to say, but I, I don't think it comes close to either list, frankly, mm-hmm. if it's shot more conventionally. Yeah. Um, because it is, you know, it is, you could say it's sort of a, not really um, unique crime story mm. on its face. Um, so you could classify it as sort of a drama, but it does have, it does have something special about it. Yeah. That I don't, I don't know if I would. Yeah. I, I, I love, I really, really like this movie. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I would put it on this list. I, it's one of those ones where do you make an exception for, what it probably inspired later on. You know, it's not quite a straight line yeah. as something, you know, like the historical impact Tom is or... is hard to ignore. Yeah. Um and back to the the proof um uh metaphor. When I think about film noirs and to me what jumps out is my most my favorite film noirs are a combination of unbelievable film and really great adherence to film noir tropes. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is an unbelievable film, but is pseudo noir. Sure. And it's an unbelievable film and it's pseudo horror. 
Sure. So does it belong on the list just lower because it's only kind of horror, but it's still unbelievable? Whereas something that is full on horror that might not be as good could even command a higher ranking. Right. So it's it's an interesting thing. It's all about where you draw the line, like how much horror has to be in it for it to be on the Rotten uh, Tomatoes list. Right, it's like right. I remember Bravo had this um, special in the early 2000s, 100 Scariest Movie Moments, and uh, I really enjoyed that. That's a great. I feel like that's yeah. like ground zero for a lot of people, especially of my age. Oh yeah, who are yeah. who are just like, yeah, this this is awesome. I I really enjoyed that special they did. They yeah. did like twenty twenty in each hour, mm-hmm. and um, th- it's funny to if if we were to look at it again now, the personalities that they have oh, from yeah. the early two thousands yeah. talking about them. But they had, I think they had like like the Willy Wonka tunnel. Oh, yeah. Scene. Hell yeah! I mean. <laughs> That's one of there's the scariest a, there things I've ever a, seen. There is that is a legitimate, frightening, scary moment yeah. in the history of film. Large Marge from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Exactly. That there are scary moments in this film, but that doesn't necessarily make it a horror film. Right. Yeah. Whereas, uh, I think this, if I remember correctly, and this is really stretching my memory, but I think the scene of him going up the, the basement staircase might have been in that list of 100 oh, scary sure. movies moments. Um, but just because it has one or two or three even uh, scary scenes doesn't necessarily mean that the whole film falls into the horror genre. Yeah, I think this is closer to like... Uh, genre definitions are silly, but yeah, I think it's closer to like a suspense movie. Like it, it feels like... Because I, I, at first I was thinking, oh, this feels kind of like Shadow of a Doubt a little bit. Yeah, I could see that. Which is not a horror movie. It's much more of a suspense film. Yeah. And so it kind of has tinges that. tinges of noir. Yeah. It's got that kind of yeah. baseline and it's got bits and pieces of it. Basically what I'm saying, to tie it back to what we said at the beginning of this episode when I brought up the heavy metal thing, mm-hmm. this is basically like the kinks where yes. it's like you can kind of, if you really want to make the case for it, you probably could, but is it going to be on anybody's, you know, top 10 heavy metal albums yeah probably not but if you bring it up to go yeah great thank you yeah it's it's kind of like one of those school exercises where um you get you get um picked for which side you're going to be on Mm -hmm. and then you formulate your discussion yes (laughs) if this is the kind of movie where if someone were we were having a if i was having a conversation about horror movies and somebody brought this up i'd go ooh, good good pull yeah so if it was your fr- if, you if, if it was your friend that called it a noir movie, you could de- you could defend that all day long. Sure, but then if it's someone you don't really care for who calls it a noir or, or a horror movie, you could be like, well, yes, <laughs> could be a real shithead about it. <laughs> That's a great way to sum this up. It's a movie you could be a real shithead about if you want to. Um, <clears throat> uh, is I think that's it. Is we cover everything? Uh, I think that's just about all I, all I, I so. had. Uh, we didn't talk about the creepy. Um, like nursery rhyme lullaby, oh which is goodness. that might be enough to put it into the horror movie category. Now, yeah, I think the about the hing hang hung, and the, oh, that too. Yes, and, and the um, what what is it? Uh, um, Something what is the I've... the song that sh- that he's singing when he's outside of Rachel's house, and oh, then she joins right. in, and yeah. she she uses Jesus in her version. Right, but right. he's yeah. I, I don't remember what the remember exact what words are, but yeah, the the singing is is enough to you. You could just make the case that the singing scenes in this are yeah the scariest parts. Yes, <laughs> uh, would you recommend it? One hundred percent, absolutely. Yeah, me too. It's it can be um, it's I, it seems to be difficult to stream currently. Mm. Um, I think you can find it on like Freevee or like Tubi or something like that. But okay. if you're looking for High quality, no commercials. I don't think it's currently available. Um, yep. If you know where to look on the internet, you know, if you were to, I don't know, if you could find some sort of archive or an organization that you know of that you might be able to search things, you might be able to find it there. But um, if you can find it, watch it. It's very cool. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's going to do it for and Night it, of the And Hunter. it might be one that, you might not enjoy the very first time you watch it. Yes. Because yeah. that was one thing I, I, I had seen it a long time ago. I remember liking it, being intrigued by it, but um, 
watched it a few times in preparation for this episode, and by the last time that I watched it, I was like, "Geez, do I like this movie?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yep, that's gonna do it for Night of the Hunter. Um, I'm gonna hit the randomizer button. Beep, boop, beep, 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 for the next episode. That's where Wes is gonna be joining us again. We're gonna be doing <laughs> uh, one cut of the dead, which Ooh. I'm interested to watch because I've heard it's very good. It is currently sitting at number eight on our list, which, having not even seen it, I'm going to say feels a bit high. So, it, um, you know what? It it could be one that absolutely blows your hair back, and you're it's like, "It's true. It's true. This deserves to be number eight. This is definitely be five, unusual, but <laughs> definitely four spots better than a quiet place or whatever sitting at number eleven. Yeah, uh, Danny, where can they find your podcast and your and your writings and stuff? Um, so podcasts you can find on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Um, is it just Shadows of Noir podcast? Just Shadows of Noir. Um, and uh, shadowsofnoir.com is the website. Um, we have a Patreon as well, and uh, we have our written articles on there. You can take a look. Um, getting to those as time permits mm-hmm. uh, takes a little bit longer to um, research and write out those written articles than do a podcast episode. So I yes. tend to lean to the podcast episodes um, when time is tight. It's um, easy. You just talk into the void for an hour and it's, feel it's, like you did a whole day's worth of work. I know. It's great. It's great. But uh, yep. So shadowsandnoir.com, Shadows and Noir podcast, Apple, Spot, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And um, Clay, thank you so much for, for having me. I well, really appreciate it. Thank you for it. coming on. I really appreciate it. This was fun. I was I was glad because this is a weird movie on the list. Mm. But I thought it was fun that it crossed over the genre. It was a perfect one to talk about. So. I, I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next time. Mm.